you, Acting Speaker. When preparing my contribution on last year's budget, I looked back on that contribution and unsurprisingly, I could almost read it word for word and it would still be relevant. This is a traditional Labor budget. It focuses on the city. It looks after Labor's mates. It treats the taxpayer like a bottomless pit of cash to boost its revenues and increases state debts. Last year, I spoke about the budget failing to take any real advantage of the enormous opportunity regional Victoria offers, particularly my electorate of South West Coast, where there is opportunity for growth, opportunity to bolster the state's economy through increased productivity, not through increased taxes. Well, the 2018-19 budget has done the same. It has squandered the extraordinary opportunity because Labor is relying on unsustainable population growth in Melbourne and has absolutely no plan for decentralisation or for regional growth. The Great South Coast region is the most productive in the state. The ABS data proves it. We punch well above our weight in terms of agricultural production, yet the government has failed to support anything to help that grow. In fact, the Great South Coast Food and Fibre Council is still waiting for money allocated to them in the last budget. And when the committee questions it, they are given all sorts of excuses. But the reality is this is typical of the process, bureaucracy and failure of this government to just deliver. On decentralisation, we know if we want people to move to the regions, we need to provide them with good schools, good health care, good recreation facil recreational facilities and efficient transport links. In the roads and rails particularly, we also need to provide industry with opportunities to grow. Instead, we see increased taxes that will not only discourage people from setting up businesses in South West Coast, it's discouraging them from setting up in Victoria. Over four years, Daniel Andrews and Labor have added 12 new taxes and increased charges. New taxes like the vacant home tax, annual property valuations, the Uber and taxi tax, the city access tax, the increased royalties on brown coal, to name a few. 12 new taxes, 12 broken promises, because he said he would not increase or deliver any new taxes. That was a lie. Then, of course, there is the proposed increases to fire services levy that we will see from next year. Of course, after the election, to pay for the sweetheart deals made with the United Firefighters Union. Whatever that may entail, but we can be assured it will be exorbitant because the unions are involved. Those on this side will now cry they cut payroll tax for regional businesses. But it's a paltry amount, a paltry attempt. There is so much more that could be done. Rather than a reward system, they're offering businesses no reward. They're not offering carrots to move to the region. Daniel Andrews has made Victoria the most taxed state in Australia, a punishment system. There is not one dollar in the budget for the Warrnambool Base Hospital refurbishment. Not one single dollar to upgrade the emergency department or to expand the operating theatres. The week before the budget was handed down, health data showed that patients at Warrnambool wait the longest for elective surgery. The emergency department built in, 1990, in the 90s was designed to handle 15,000 patients per year, but last year there were more than 25,000 presentations to the department. How can we expect to continue to attract the wonderful health professionals that we actually do have in our part of the world if we don't have the facilities to be able to facilitate their, their uh, needs? And I know two general surgeons that are about to retire in uh, Warrnambool in the next few couple of years. I don't understand how we think we can attract general surgeons, which are very needed, to facilities where they probably won't be able to be guaranteed theatre time it's not going to work. We've got the job done, the master plan is done, the feasibility of study is done, and we're ready to build. It's time for this government to do it. My community is bitterly disappointed. There was no funding to get the hospital upgraded. The Labor government has had four years to get on with this job and match the Liberal Party's commitment to do what needs to be done to do the job of governing, of government. 
Instead, they put their mate in the upper house, Mr Purcell, in charge of a committee and gave him $7.5 million to get the project ready for inclusion in the state budget. In other words, they delayed. Labor have neglected to fund this project, but Mr Purcell in the other place shares the blame for this neglect. He was the chair of the committee. He was the man charged with securing funding. He failed, and it's the people of South West Coast that will continue to wait for treatment. Mr Purcell's excuse is the planning isn't complete. How does he explain the Ballarat-based hospital receiving full funding when planning for that hospital is nowhere near as advanced as Warrnambool? The member for Bunningyong said it in, his, in this House at the last sitting, and I quote, this massive amounts, um, announcement of funding will see them be able to complete their master plan, knowing that everything they put in their master plan can be reliably funded into the future. Well, our master plan's complete, so is our feasibility study, and responsibly done. Why does the Ballarat Base Hospital not have to wait until its planning is completed? Why is it that the hospital give, this hospital is given special treatment? Why are the people of South West Coast continually being told they have to wait when other projects are given full funding straight up? James Purcell, Daniel Andrews and the newly minted Labor candidate for South West Coast, Kylie Gaston, must answer these questions. In an email to me the day prior to the budget being delivered, Mr Purcell said that the cost of this project was likely to blow out by 50 million. So once again, we see a key project that this government is running blowing out. But it still remains unclear if we will get anything extra for that 50 million, or will it be like the level crossing removals, removals or the Metro Tunnel project? Extra cost, but the same number of crossings removed and the same length of tunnel. I am not aware of what is this extra cost will involve, because Mr Purcell has failed to set up the promise briefing on the project, but I do know there has been plenty of planning done. A master plan was completed and forecasts and projections completed, and responsibly so. The only thing that needed to be done was the public consultation. Mr Purcell and Labor have done nothing but delay. Perhaps it's time for Mr Purcell to release publicly the work his committee has done, so we can get some idea of why this project has failed to progress. Mr Purcell also has some questions to answer about his failure to secure funding for the Reed Oval upgrade in Warrnambool, another project he was telling everyone who would listen he could get funding for. The Reed Oval is supposed to be the region's premier sporting ground, but if anyone has seen the facilities, they would agree it's not the case, and Bendigo certainly pointed that out at the Interleague game just last Saturday publicly in, the, publicly in today's paper. Change rooms built in the 70s, inadequate match day facilities to accommodate media and fans, a substandard playing service and a lack of lighting are keeping the Oval in the dark ages. The facilities also poses an OH&S risk. The timekeeper's box is accessed by, accessed by a ladder and a hatch in the floor. If someone was to have a medical episode up there, it would be near impossible for medical professionals to remove the person safely and in a quick fashion. The Liberals Nationals got the project started funding a new scoreboard and female change room and upgrades to the netball courts. It's unfortunate, though, Labor and James Purcell have not continued it. But then again, it's not hard to see why this oval and the lighting upgrade at Hanlon Park in Portland were forgotten. I mean, they are not AFL-owned. They do not get handouts. What an absolute insult for our local clubs in my electorate, which mostly run on volunteer labour, volunteers that we're celebrating this week who do an enormous amount of work right across the electorate in all areas, and volunteers who run our sporting clubs, but they uh, raise their funds through fundraising, and they are told but they can apply for a loan that bears interest to upgrade their facilities, whilst at the same time the AFL, a non-taxpaying organisation, gets a handout to upgrade its own facilities and a sweetheart deal to build a new headquarters. How anyone on that side of this house thinks it's OK is beyond me. You really have forgotten the little guys. As someone commented on my social media pages, if you don't invest in the grassroots, there will be no one to play in the flash big stadiums in the future. I do note, however, that there are some unspecified buckets of cash in the budget for projects just like this, obviously put aside to tie these important projects to an election. And I have no doubt now a Labor candidate has finally been announced in South West Coast, there will be a lot of ministers flying in to make these pledges. But the damage is done. Mr Purcell has been very active telling people he will get them funding in the budget. 
The community is now bitterly disappointed and seeing straight through Labor's games. The people of South West Coast will not be hoodwinked. They know they are being dudded. If these promises do not come at an election, how can the people of South West Coast believe they will be delivered? James Purcell, with help from his mates on that side of the House, has been running around over the past four years saying, I'll get you this and I'll get you that. But nothing's happened. You haven't delivered, so what will make it any different after the election? You just keep moving the goalpost further out of reach. On education funding, I see the Warrnambool Special Development School was included. Work is already underway on this project because my community and I, and I shamed the government into action. I was proud to stand with the member of Q in December last year to announce that if a Liberal government is elected, the school would be immediately funded. Obviously not wanting to look foolish, Labor fast-tracked the money almost instantly. I have no doubt had I have no doubt, had I, had I and my community not been so vocal, nothing would have happened until now, and work would not have started on the school as it has. There was some more money for schools maintenance this year's, in this year's budget, which I'm sure the principals are happy with. I'm disappointed to hear, though, that the schools in my electorate received money in last year's budget are still working through the process. They're being told to put larger than normal contingencies in their budgets because of the price of tenders. This may explain why the remaining expenditure for the Special Development School is around four million left over. Why can't that four million be used for an undercover outdoor area or playground that weren't included in the plan? Very important for children with special needs and often compromised chests that in our weather in the winter, they're very, very important for. Rather than just accepting cost blowouts, Labor should be demanding this money be spent wisely and effectively, not just accepting exorbitant pricing and telling the schools to make do. Last year, one of the schools was given 2.6 million for improvements. They wanted to, or they need to, replace the wooden windows to aluminium. They also need to be, uh, be able to modernise the school. They also need to get the asbestos removed. They're being told, don't expect the windows to be able to be done. It's not going to be able to be done. And they're saying, can we at least be able to open a window of one classroom? That's disgusting. But as the process goes on, they've had to alter their expectations. There was so little to, do, to deal with the recycling crisis in this budget, which is, a, which is actually gripping the state, and other than giving handouts to the council, which actually does nothing to address the problem in the long term. It's a Band-Aid solution. I would have loved to have seen money for the industry to develop a waste energy plant in our region, or grants for local companies to improve their equip equipment and processes so waste can be value-added and used here rather than being sent overseas. Councils are increasing the cost of their collection, collection services, pushing up household bills and the cost of living because this government and its inaction on this critical issue. The Minister for Energy has handed out some cash and washed her hands of the problem. She'll blame councils, she'll blame the collection companies, she'll blame anyone. But the fact is, her government has washed its hands and the cost of living is growing and it's their fault. There was no money for the Lookout Drug and Alcohol Residential Rehab Centre, a much needed service to fill a gaping hole in the service delivery in the South West. This is a project I'm deeply passionate about and will continue to advocate strongly on. It's too important to ignore and I know the Minister for Mental Health recognises that. So I will continue talking to him until that money's announced. Now roads, because they are a key issue for my electorate. Granted, the government is spending money, but when you break down the package, you see at the amount actually being spent on roads is a paltry 1.4% increase on last year, hardly enough to cover CPI and the increase of cost of material. A good chunk of the package has been spent on setting up a new bu bureaucracy, which will apparently bring more effective repairs on to regional roads and rural roads. We've seen this government and the fat cat, we've seen this government is the fat cat's friend, so it's my fear this body will just become another, another level of bureaucracy, swallowing up money for road repairs to cover wages. There is around 200 million to continue the rollout of wire rope barriers. This is money that needs to be spent actually fixing the roads first. Why rope people in when you haven't even got a decent road to, to drive on? It's dangerous. Nothing wrong with the concept, but fix the road first and don't rope us in. I also want some assurances these repairs will last longer than a few weeks. That's where that there will be checks and balances put in place and some sort of plan. That is what one of the biggest failings of road repairs, and it's time that the minister 
and the government realise that. But of course, this government is so accepting of cost blowouts on all its projects because they can spin it out to say they are spending records amount on infrastructure despite getting nothing extra to show for it. This is a typical Labor budget, just as we've seen for the past four years. I call the Minister for